Father, today we confess our weakness. We recognize our, our, our willingness to abandon our faith, to, to chase after those things of destruction. And we confess that because we need your grace, we need your mercy, we need your love and your power in our lives. So we simply come to you knowing that you never fail us, knowing that you are a God who is faithful to the very end, a God who has rescued us through Jesus Christ and has given us life and hope and blessings beyond imagination. And so, God, we come today submitting ourselves, asking for your grace, your power, and your love to penetrate our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to Philippians chapter 3. Uh, we're continuing our study called A Letter to Friends, uh, Philippians chapter 3. If you don't have a Bible with you, that is fine. There's some in the pews around you, look just like this one. Grab one of those and turn to page 1,249 and you'll find Philippians 3. Uh, we're going to be looking at verse 17 and beyond. And by the way, if, uh, if you're a guest with us and you need a Bible, you don't have one, uh, you just you go, I want to read the Bible, I, I don't own one. Take one of these with you. It's our gift to you. We want you to have the Word of God and read it and let it change your life. Hey, I want to congratulate each and every one of you today on your victory, uh, whether you know it or not, uh, because you are alive at this moment in history and living in the United States of America, you have won the lottery of history. I was going to say, see, some of you are like going, what do you mean I won? Where's my prize? You're living your prize. That's just it. Yeah, you know, I hope you realize that you didn't choose when and where you were going to be born, right? And if you choose that, no, you didn't. You just were born in, and you happen to live in the United States of America. You happen to live today, this point in history, and you've got so many blessings and so much affluence and so many things going for you that, that it, we just aren't even aware of it. We're just awash in the, this stuff. And in fact, uh, if you study history... You, know, you find it interesting that really the last 50 years is the first time in history that a nation, and there's some others, but mostly ours, has been so wealthy that we have too much food to eat and it's become a problem. See, most people throughout history were trying to get enough food to eat so they could stay alive, and we've got the opposite problem. And so we've got these things that no one's ever heard of before, like diet plans and gyms. Right, because people just worked and tried to, you know, have enough food to eat. So, so congratulations! And and as we celebrate our nation's birthday, I really hope you can appreciate how privileged we are to live as citizens of the greatest country in the world. Now, I confess, I haven't been in every country in the world, but uh, I have been in a lot. I, I've been in 25 different countries, so I've got a, a base to compare to. And I think uh, America is the best. So today I want to talk, first of all, about American citizenship. And uh, what are the marks? What are the identifying factors of our citizenship? What makes it such a privilege and honor to belong to the United States of America? And, and it goes way beyond the superficial. You know, if you've traveled at all, then you know there's some of those, those little things that automatically, when you get back, you kind of like go, this is awesome to be in the States. Little things like, you know, people obeying traffic laws. Okay, other countries have traffic laws. Most people just don't pay any attention to them. And, and, and I can say that from experience. I mean, and, and I know some of you are going, but, but Pastor, you've confessed that you, you know, drive over the speed limit. You know, and so you, you flaunt the, the traffic laws. No, I'm talking about traffic laws like in Nigeria, the, you know, the phrase, if you don't like the way I drive, stay off the sidewalk, actually applies, okay? <laughs> and if they run into a traffic jam, you know what they do there? They don't just like wait for it and complain like we do. They, no, they start driving in the other lanes of traffic the wrong way. Like, I'm going, I don't care about anything else. It's crazy, you know, or, or, you know, the, the fact that, you know, one of the, the great things about America that is so undervalued by us is public restrooms. I know you think they're gross and nasty, and they are, but they're there. I mean, that's, an, that's a blessing. Do you know what it's like to have to go, and there isn't one anywhere? You know, you're just kind of out of luck. So you come home, and you go, thank you, God, for that skanky bathroom and that <laughs> gas station in the middle of nowhere. It's a blessing from you. You know, or, you know, just simply put, America is awesome, you know, in a superficial way, because we have dining options. 
You know, think about the conversation when you leave here. Where do you want to eat? <laughs> I don't know. I don't care. Where do you want to eat? I don't know. It's great. And then you have a half hour conversation about where you're going to go eat, and you go eat at the same place. <laughs> right? See, we do that, but we actually have the luxury of having options. Because if you're in another country, if there is a restaurant, you know, or, or option, like more than one, they all serve the same food. You know, it's like, uh, what do we do? Is let's, which one do you want to eat at, not what do you want to eat? So, you know, those are, but those are superficial things that make our nation great. I want to talk about the attributes and characteristics that really make it awesome to be a U.S. citizen. Uh, first one is freedom, you know. We're free, and, and that is so cool. Our liberty is guaranteed by the Bill of Rights, and we still have freedom of religion and freedom of speech and, and freedom of the press and right to assemble and freedom to bear arms and freedom from unreasonable search and seizures. And, and all these are wrapped up in that Bill of Rights that our founders said, hey, this is important. We've got to have this to protect individual liberty. And whether you realize it or not, our freedom affects every part of our life, how we think and how we live. We are, it's in our DNA. You know, if you were born in this country or you've been here a long, long, long time, it's in our DNA. We just, we don't even realize how addicted to choices we are. You know, we don't want anybody telling us that we have to do anything, do we? No, because we want to make up our minds, our choices, and, and that's a marked difference. When you travel and you're, especially if you travel to a place that's been under a, like a totalitarian regime for a long time or communist for a long time, the group that just got back from Albania, three generations under communist rule. They didn't have choices. You know, uh, I've been in China, and I've talked to, you know, young professionals. I mean, they were, you know, teachers, because we were working mostly with English teachers. And here they were, young professionals, but they had no choices. They didn't get to choose where they went to school. They didn't get to choose uh, what they studied in school. They took a test, and they said, here's what you're going to study. Or you can go work in the farms or the factories. That's it. That's your options. And, and so once they got their degree and they're there teaching, they've got no options. They, if they don't like it, too bad. The same option, factories and farms are, the, are what's left for you. It, you know, it's not like here we can reinvent our lives over and over and over again if we want to. And I've, and I've looked in the eyes of, of these, these young professionals and seen the desperation that they don't have choice. They don't have freedom to come and to go and change careers and travel and do all those kinds of things. Folks, we are free, and that is one of the, the great hallmarks of being an American citizen. And then the second attribute I want to talk about is service. Service. It is uniquely American the way that we serve. Uh, we serve our country. We serve our communities. We serve other people. I, I mean, uh, think about it. Yesterday we were celebrating and honoring military service. And in the United States, it's been completely voluntary for 40 years. You have the best fighting force in the world, best equipped, best trained, all that kind of stuff. It's volunteer. People do it because they choose to. Uh, we've, we've got, you know, firefighters and, and police officers that serve and protect and rescue and do all that kind of stuff because they choose to. They want to serve their communities. We recognize volunteers that make our cities better places to live and, and help those struggling and downtrodden. People giving of their time and energy. They don't get paid for it. They just go, I want to make this place better. And see, no country in the world is more generous towards other nations than the United States. Now, if you follow politics, you'll hear um, complaints from other countries, especially like Europe. Uh, countries will complain, well, the U.S. should give a greater percentage of their GDP, their gross domestic product, uh, to help other countries. Because they only gave, we only gave as a nation, through our government, $10 billion to other countries last year. Only $10 billion. And people are like complaining because they want us to give more as a percentage. You know what they don't mention? And this kind of irritates me. But we, as the citizens of the United States of America, gave $50 billion to other countries. You guys gave $50 billion to other countries. Five times what our government gave, we gave. Now, there's not another country in the world where the people of that country are given five times as much as their government to help other people that most of the time they'll never meet. You know, if there's a flood, if there's an earthquake, if there's a disaster, then, then what do Americans do? We, we give. Now, most of the time, the world doesn't credit that to our country because we give through religious organizations. We give to disaster relief through our faith-based you know, organizations that are feeding the hungry. We sponsor hospitals and orphanages and colleges and schools through our church groups. I mean, and, and so they don't want to count that. But, but guys, we live in a generous country that serves the world. 
So American citizenship is awesome because of our freedom, our service, and because of hope. Hope. America offers the hope of a better life, the hope of freedom, education, of actually reaping the benefits of hard work. And, and, and by the way, politics aside, that's why the world wants to come here. That's why people want to come here. Uh, you know, I don't know about you, I, I read stuff, and a lot of times the, the reports just drive me nuts because they tell us all the time how much the world hates America. You ever read that? Wow, the world hates America. They hate America. Every place I've gone in the world, you know what people say to me? I want to come to America. I want to come to America. I want to live someplace like America. I, that's the place I want to be. And, and, and you kind of experience that, and then you read the headlines of the media, and you kind of go, there's a disconnect here. Because the average person all around the world dreams of being able to have a life somewhat like what we have. So uh, I hope you recognize the privilege uh, of being a U.S. citizen. I hope you honor those who make it possible for us to continue enjoying that. But there's so much more. The Apostle Paul talked about dual citizenship. Uh, and, and Paul was a Roman citizen, and then he talked about uh, a higher citizenship, excuse me, if you will. And so Philippians chapter 3, I want to pick up at verse 17, and, and I want you to listen to Paul as he writes to the church, to believers, uh, about the situation. And, and I also want you to think about our situation because the words are so relevant to where we are today as a nation. It says, Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many, of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction their God is their belly, and their, they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Uh, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, if you believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, uh, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then you are a citizen of heaven. You're a citizen of heaven. So I want to talk about heavenly citizenship. Uh, like our U.S. citizenship, uh, there's some attributes I want to emphasize. Like the attribute of freedom. Paul says in his letter to Galatians, uh, for freedom, Christ has set us free. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Paul says, look, Jesus came and suffered and died, not just to give you eternal life, but to set you free. Free from what? Free from the bondage of sin and death and hell. You see, every one of us is addicted to sin, not just addicted to sin, but we literally lived as a slave to sin until Jesus accomplished what he did on the cross. And now, as a follower of Jesus Christ, you are free to not be enslaved, ensnared. You don't have to live under the ownership of sin. Now, that means that, that whatever destructive habits you have in your life, you know, those patterns of, of acting that hurt you, that hurt your family, that hurt your friends that hurt your relationships, you don't have to live as a slave to those anymore. God has given you the ability to say no. God has given you the ability to resist that temptation. God has given you the ability to live free. You and I have the choice of how we're going to live. Are we going to live in the patterns of destruction? Or are we going to live in the blessings of Christ? Because we're free. And Paul says, stop living as a slave to what you don't have to anymore. But not only that, Jesus sets us free to love. Free to love. First of all, he gives us the freedom to love ourselves. I know it sounds a little bit narcissistic, but remember, God loves you. God loves you, and he wants to, you to value yourself. He wants you to understand how precious you are to him. He loves you so much that he sent Jesus into this world to suffer and die for your sins so that you could become his sons and daughters. That's awesome. So when you look in the mirror... Do you see somebody 
that you value, that you appreciate as being loved by God? Do you see somebody who is worthy of love? Because you are. And you are free to, to look in the mirror and see somebody that is valued enough by God that he's willing to sacrifice Jesus for you. So love yourself. And then you're free to love your neighbor as yourself. That's why it's important to understand who you are in the eyes of God because now you can love your neighbor as yourself. And, and, and why do we love our neighbor besides the fact that God tells us to? Because they are made in the image of God. Right? And so we need to treat every person with dignity and respect and kindness and patience because love is patient and love is kind. And, and we need to value them because we're to love them as ourselves. Here, here's a disconnect, by the way, in our, the way that our culture is going. You guys just need to see this. And, and especially parents, teach your kids to, to, that the reason that they love is because people are made in the image of God and therefore they're worthy of love and respect. But right now in our culture, you see this happening. We have a culture that demands that we treat people with dignity and respect, right? You got to treat people with dignity, all people with dignity and respect, and yet they're divorcing themselves from the reason for doing that. Because the reason that every person deserves dignity and respect is because they're made in the image of God. And yet we've kicked God out of the cultural conversation. We've divorced, divorced ourselves from his principles and his precepts that this country was founded on. And yet we still demand treating people with dignity and respect. Guess what's going to happen to that? That is going to crumble like a house of cards. Because if you tell people you have to treat everyone with dignity and respect, but you don't tell them why... They will obey when it's convenient. But this country was founded on the why being you obey because it's right. It's a conviction. It's not a convenience. It's because every person is made in the image of God. And, and, and guys, we need to raise up a generation of children and grandchildren that understand the why so they can still champion a culture of true dignity and true respect that is rooted in the fundamental belief that all people are made in the image of God. Our founders got it. All people are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. See, they, they understood that. Uh, it's going to change our culture. And it is changing our culture. And that's one of those things that, and I don't want to be prophetic, but it's, it's leaning that way more and more. And we're going to get more unkind and more disrespectful even as we demand that respect and, and uh, dignity more. It's going to go away because we're not rooting it in a why. The why is image of God. And then we're told, or we're told, we're set free to not only love ourselves and our neighbors, but to love our enemies. Jesus said, you have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. We're going to get to do that, not just on an individual basis with the jerks in your life, we're going to get to do that corporately as the church of Jesus Christ in America. Because there's going to be a lot of, of things said about us uh, that aren't really true. And our response is not anger. But our response has to be love because we cannot represent Jesus unless we reflect his character. And, and uh, there's some of you that are, that are angry and, and you get immersed in the politics and things and, and you really want to, to express that anger. And, and let me just tell you something. If you're getting angrier and angrier, uh, try this. Turn off the news. <laughs> Every now and then I just got to do a fast from the news. I just got to stop reading editorials and I got to stop, you know, yeah, you can check the headlines, make sure the world didn't end. But, you know, but stop immersing yourselves in the body politic and instead do what Paul said in Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, honorable, pure, lovely, of good report, let your mind dwell on these things. Read the Bible instead. Seriously, stop, stop reading the, the news stuff that makes you mad and read the word of God that gives you hope and it'll change your perspective because we can't really represent Jesus if we're angry. And if we're yelling at people and we're accusing, you know, if we're trying to defend ourselves, guys, here's the, here's the clue. We need to love differently. The next wave of the battle needs to be us loving. 
And as we love people in the way that Jesus loved his enemies, then what we're going to see is, is the power of God manifest in the church and the people of God. And, and, and he will get the victory because he'll get the glory. And, and he will do things that we can't even imagine because we have not lost the day. We've simply changed the dynamics of the discussion. And Christ has set you free. You're free indeed. Free to live apart and above that, that destructive behavior and free to love in a whole different way. Second mark of the heavenly citizenship is service. You guys are noticing a pattern here by now, aren't you? Jesus said, Matthew 20, 28, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. But to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus was a servant. And he wasn't afraid to get dirty, roll up his sleeves. Uh, he washed the feet of the disciples to demonstrate that. And he calls his citizens to serve others. And I've already shared one of the reasons I think America is a generous nation is because we're a nation that was influenced by faith in Jesus. And so we serve. And, and we don't just do acts of service, but we serve because that is our core identity uh, as followers of Jesus Christ. And, and of course, as, as Calvary, we talk about serving our community all the time. And, and I want to take just a moment and explain why we serve. Because you might go, yeah, service is great. We're supposed to serve. Why we do, you know, but, but you never thought about the why. Let me take, give you three reasons Calvary serves. And three reasons why, if, as a follower of Jesus, you ought to serve. Uh, first one is because we follow Jesus. <laughs> I know, that's so simple, right? We follow Jesus. It doesn't mean that we just wave a flag in, as a fan of Jesus and go, yay, Jesus, now I'm going to go live my life my way. No, when you follow Jesus, you say, Jesus, you're the one who kind of shows me what life is like, and I'm going to follow in your footsteps, and th therefore I'm going to imitate you, and the things you do, I'm going to do. And what did Jesus do? Served people. Right? He, and in fact, at the Last Supper, when he got down on his hands and knees and he washed the feet of the disciples, he got up afterwards and he said, hey, by the way, I've done this for you, so you should do it for others. I set the example for you so that you would do it. I'm your master and I served you. You're the servants, therefore you're supposed to do what to others? Serve them. So we serve because we follow Jesus. It's actually, you know, our identity, and so we embrace that. Secondly, we serve because it is the path to success. I know. People go, well, what I really want is I want to do stuff my way and have God bless it and make me successful. That's kind of our plan usually. You know, we're just like everybody else, only, you know, after we come up with our plan to how to be successful, how to be happy, how to have a great life, then we kind of say, okay, God, here's my plan. Would you please bless it and make it all work out? And he never does. Hasn't in my life. I'm pretty sure he hasn't in your life. No, what, what God does is he tells us, hey, if you'll live your life my way, I will lead you into blessings and I will make you successful. Successful being joy, peace, love, all those things that we talk about uh, and, and that we really want. He says, I will make your life successful if you will live your life my way. And, and God's way to success is serving how do I know this? Because in Matthew 20, right before Jesus said the passage we just read, he said, hey, by the way, if you want to be great, if any of you wants to be great, he has to be the servant of everyone. So if you aspire to success, then you need to embrace this identity and this ethic of serving. And you go, okay, I'm going to be a servant. I'm going to try to help the people around me. I'm going to try to help you be successful in your life. I'm going to try to do the things that will bless your life. And if I do that, Guess what's going to happen? I'm going to end up being a success. If I help you succeed, I'm going to end up being a success. That sounds crazy, doesn't it? Yeah, it does, but God said it. Try this on. Humble yourself under God's mighty hand, which, by the way, means that you'll do what he says and you'll serve people, and he will exalt you in due time. God will lift you up. Exalt sounds kind of cool, doesn't it? exalted yeah he'll lift you up and, and so here's here's the thing if you do it your way you're like i'm going to try to lift myself up try that sometime doesn't work i'm going to try to exalt myself that doesn't work either 
But when you do it God's way, then he lifts you up. And that's why serving is so important. And I share that because, you know, part of my calling is to bless you and tell you how God wants to bless you. And so if you'll take on this role of a servant, you'll look around and go, how do I make everybody else's life better? God's going to be the one who's lifting you up. Thirdly, we serve uh, here at Calvary because it is our strategy for how we're going to lead people to Jesus. You know, I don't know if you noticed, but in the last 50 years, there's a lot of times that the church was just yelling at people. Pretty much, your life is wrong, our life is right, you need to change. And somewhere along the way, people stopped listening to us. What we shared was absolute truth, but we shared it in a really tacky way. And people stopped listening. They just stopped engaging. Yeah, whatever, blah, blah, blah. It's those church people. And so our strategy is this. We're going to go out and we're going to serve the community. We're going to shut up. Sounds kind of awkward because we're told to declare, proclaim the good news. We are proclaiming the good news. Here's the way. We're going to stop preaching. We're going to start serving. And as we serve this community, as we go out and we do those things, guess what happens? (laughs) People ask us, why are you doing this? Why does your church do that? And you know what we get to tell them? Because Jesus changed our life and he can change your life too. I know, but why are you serving this? Why are you this way? Why are you doing this? Well, because God loves you, and we're here to tell you that and show you that. Oh. I haven't had anyone get annoyed at me because I shared with them why we serve. Nobody's ever said, stop preaching, because they just asked the question. Right? And they go, oh, well, I might come to your church. See, it surprises people and it disarms them and it takes the walls down. And so when we go out and we serve in the name of Jesus and the name of Calvary, we're doing it intentionally, not just to be good neighbors, but because we want to tear down those walls of distrust and abuse that have happened from the church for the last 50 years. We want to tear those walls down so that people will actually engage us in a conversation that is respectful and kind and truthful. That's our strategy. We're just going to go out and serve people and let them ask us why. And watch what God's doing. By the way, it's been kind of working. We baptized like 147 people last year. Isn't that cool? So service is an attribute of kingdom citizenship. And then finally, Jesus' citizens are identified by hope. Did you catch what Paul said? But our citizenship is in heaven and from it. We await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject everything to himself. In other words, he says, Jesus wins. Our citizenship is with him, and he's coming back. So as citizens of of Jesus' kingdom, we are filled with a hope beyond this world that one day we'll receive new bodies that never get old or weak or sick or die. Anybody want one? Yeah. Yeah going to be cool. You know, when we do funerals, we talk about that, and it's not just like, well, we're really hoping, we're just saying nice words. No, we believe this stuff. This is what drives us, that, that heaven is better than anything we can imagine, that our new bodies are better than anything that we've ever had, that one day we're going to inhabit this new heaven and new earth, the perfect world God created for us, and that no matter what happens to us in this life, it's not worth comparing to what will be in the next That this hope allows us to live boldly and courageously and freely without fear. I know a lot of people who are afraid. They're afraid of how the Greeks are going to vote today. Because of what's going to do the world economy. They're afraid of what's going on in China and the markets. And what's going to happen? Is it going to affect us? They're afraid of the next thing the Supreme Court's going to decide or who we're going to elect. And and they're just fearful. And here's the thing. Our hope is not in this world. Our hope is in Christ. And he's already won. And therefore, we don't have to be afraid because we have this hope that's in us. And we know that God's got this and he's in charge of the people who are in charge. And, and, and yeah, it's not all going to play out the way we want it to. But in the end, we win. And that's our hope that allows us to live differently, allows us to live joyfully, even when the world's not as we wish it were. So today, do you have this hope in you? Do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Have you become a Jesus citizen? Yesterday after the the 4th of July service down at the Aquatic Center, we had the privilege of baptizing five people down in the lake. And isn't that cool? Four of them were at the service. And one of them was just watching them and said, hey, I want to do that too. 
and they got to share Christ with him, and he became a believer, and they baptized him. And, and so, you know, have you settled this identity that you're in the kingdom, that you have dual citizenship? Because if not, we want to talk to you. We want to share with you. We want to see you take that step. Now, one kind of final thought. You know, I already shared with you, I love my country. I, I love America for what it is. I love America for what it was. Uh, uh, sometimes I'm concerned about what it, it seems to be becoming. Uh, but the reality is, and, and we need to hold on to this, the United States of America became a nation 230 years ago yesterday. It had a beginning. It'll have an end. I mean, we're all hoping that we're not around for that day, but, you know, we're, it, it, that, that's historical reality. But Jesus' kingdom is without end. It, it goes on and on and on. It's growing and advancing, and one day justice will be served, and all the wrongs will be righted, and God will reign, and we will live in that kingdom. Uh, so think about this. You look at the world around you, and we know that the, what our hope is in, and we know our future but you look at the world around you, and you may not like it, and you're going, God, do something about this. And maybe you, like a lot of other Americans, have been praying for revival. Maybe you just started recently. Maybe you've been praying for revival for 20 years because you've seen this wave moving in our culture. But let me just point something out. America, by the way, is never, never mentioned in the Bible. Okay, We're not a biblically defined nation. Israel was. Okay, the people of God, Old Testament. You guys have read it, right? And, and, and so they were the people of God, and God raised up prophets, and the prophets said, hey, everybody needs to repent, and they didn't. And they'd preach to them, hey, everybody needs to repent, and the people ignored them. Sometimes they even killed them. And, uh, and you know how God changed his people and drew them back to himself? Judgment. Judgment. He would send some army from the outside and they'd basically smash his own people and then everybody would suddenly realize how awesome God is and they would turn their hearts back to God and, and they would get right with God and all would be well and then God would deliver them. And, and I want you to, as, as believers in Jesus, as dual citizens, I want you to realize that we're praying for God to work and bless our country and it may be that God is answering our prayers even as we look at the world around us. And it may be that as, a, as this country, we need more pain to turn back to God. We need more uh, judgment to respond to the one who loves us and has called us. And, and here's the thing. However God is working and however that happens in America, our mission and our future are already settled. And that never changes. And so God calls us to be great citizens of a great nation, okay? Be the best citizen you can. Vote your conscience. Vote biblical uh, principles, you know, uh, and, and yet realize that our hope is not in who we elect. Our hope is in the one who has chosen to love us and save us from hell. And as long as we're living for him and representing him and pointing people to him, then he's going to show up in your life and you're going to have the joy and you're going to have the peace and you're going to have the victory that the world is desperate for. And I pray that today that fuels you with the joy of Christ. Let's pray. Father, thanks for loving us. Thank you that we don't have to be afraid. Thank you that, that we can hold on to you because you hold on to us forever. Your love never fails. And today we simply pray that, that you would speak peace into our hearts, even as this world seems out of control. God, help us to see that your kingdom is growing and advancing even when the darkness around us grows. And we want to represent you as the sons and daughters of God. So help us to love even our enemies. Help us to, to believe even when things look bad because you are at work and we can trust you. God, thank you for what you're doing in the life in this community. Thank you for doing life of this church and the people who are part of it. I pray your blessings would continue in Jesus' name. Amen. God together.